Right, thank you everybody for joining us on, on the Berry Radio Society and Warrington Amateur Radio Club um, talk, um, which will be given by Michael G Zero POT on uh, an introduction to summits on the air. So over to you, Michael. Okay, so let me share my screen. Fantastic. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, Quick note, if uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end to ask questions, but I've got a lot to get through um, tonight, so uh, I'm going to crack on. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat and we can either get to them at the end or if there's something burning that someone wants to ask in real time, don't forget to unmute yourself and shout. Um, I won't be able to see the chat so during the talk like uh, because of my setup. Mm -hmm and hopefully everyone can mute themselves. Right, if you have seen me talk about summits on the air before, you will know that I sometimes do a talk where I go into quite a lot of details about the rules and regulations of summits on the air, and also all of the tools and the planning and the health and safety. But tonight, I thought I'd make it a lot more fun. I'm gonna skip through the rules and regulations and the essence of what summits on the air SOTA is, pretty quickly so that we can get on to looking at a bit more at backpacking portable stations. Now, normally I would have just called this a portable station, but I attended a presentation at the weekend by a Canadian guy talking about portable operating, where he was basically taking his whole shack in the boot of the car to a campsite or to um, a national park and setting up on the picnic table next to the car. Um, so, so that's not quite the same thing for me. And I like to do um, what I call lightweight backpacking portable, which also lends itself brilliantly to summits on the air. So I want to go through some of the ideas, concepts and, and great features of a good backpacking portable um, station. So let me just see if I can get my slides moving for you. There we go. Hopefully these will update reasonably real time for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, SOTA, what it is. I'm going to touch more on why it's really good for portable operators, how it supports us in making a lot, plenty of contacts. And then we'll look at um, a good SOTA backpacking portable station, looking at radios, um, aerials, masks, batteries, and a little bit on keys as well, because I tend to do a little bit more on the CW side when I'm doing SOTA. So what is SOTA or Summits on the Air? I'm sure most people know by now, um, it's an awards program, not a contest. So it sounds a bit contesty if you hear SOTA operators at work, because it can be quite quick exchanges, um, quick call signs, signal report, tends to be an accurate signal report, as accurate as you can make it, rather than the normal contest 599, but the overs can be quite quick. So it does sound a bit contest-like, but it's not. The whole aim of SOTA is to encourage portable operation, typically from hilly or mountainous um, locations. Now, it's it's going to be 19 years old this year. Um, and it was originally, I understand, the idea, the concept of a chap called John Linford, G3WGV. And he toyed around it for quite some time before coming across uh, Richard, G3CWI of um, Soda Beams fame. Uh, he came across uh, Richard's Venture Radio website, and that nudged him into contacting Richard with the seed of an idea. Um, and beginning to develop it further. And the two of them came up with this, this full concept initially just in the UK, but now the last time I looked at the end of last year, um, it was up to 178 associations across roughly 76 countries. So it's become incredibly popular. The thing I love about it is it's accessible to all abilities and all mobilities. So there are two aspects to it, as we'll see shortly, chasing and, and activating. But even as an activator, activating hilltops, there's still the possibility to get to some hilltops, even if you've got very low mobility. So fantastically open to everyone and also open to shortwave listeners. So shortwave listeners can take part in it as well. So how does it work? As I said, there's two sides to this. There's the activators and the chasers. So the activators are those virile men and women who go climbing hills, setting up portable radio stations, come rain, shine, snow, hail, 
and making contacts, whereas the chasers are the lazy, shack-dwelling, slipper-wearing, hot chocolate-drinking um, operators who sit in their lovely cosy shacks trying to make contact with these people up on top of hills. Now, personally, I'm an activator, but I have to also say thank you. Thank you to all of those chasers, because without you, I wouldn't have all the fun that I do. So both sides of this are an essential element. There are qualifying hills that are worth points. So that, are, that raises two key questions. What are these qualifying hills and, and what are the points? So to qualify as a SOTA summit, a hill has to have a prominence of 150 meters. That's 500 feet in old money. What's that? It means it has to stick up above the surrounding countryside by at least 150 metres. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be immediate. So my local hill is on a ridgeway and it drops off either side 150 metres fairly quickly. Um, it's very steep, but because it's on a ridgeway side to side, it's tens of kilometres before it drops off. But it has that prominence. Summits can be worth one point, two points, four points, six points, eight points or 10 points. And that is vaguely related to the height of the hill. Um, now there's some variation in that, but typically your basic hill, which is only about 150 meters um, above the, uh, the, the surrounding hills, you know, the surrounding countryside will be about worth one point. Whereas a mountain, Snowdon, somewhere nice and, nice and tall will be, you know, thousands, um, thousand foot or thousand, thousand meters? I'm trying to think what Snowden is. That, that would typically be about 10 points and everything in between. They actually fudge it a little bit to make sure that each region has a reasonably good selection of um, summits of different points. But uh, that, that's a basic level. Um, activators can earn the points for a summit just once in each 12 month period so that means when i go to my local hill the first time i activate it it's worth one point so i score one point and that's the only time i can get that point that year i can go and operate there as much as i like and give points away to other people but i'll only earn the point once and the idea behind that is it'll encourage me to go and work as many different hills as i possibly can gets me out gets me activating for the chasers, they can earn new points every single day. So someone can work me on my local summit on a Monday and earn a point, and they can work another station on a Tuesday and earn another point. In fact, they could work me every day of the week and earn points. I just get the one, they get a point every single time. The reason for that is we want to encourage chasers to chase. Otherwise, a popular hill, by the time somebody's worked it at the beginning of the year, none of the chasers would want to chase it later in the year. So this ensures that chasers keep chasing. There's one other thing you can do, which is called Summit to Summit, where the two of you earn the, um, the sum of the points of the two hills. So if I'm on a 10 point and I'm working someone on a one point, the two of us earn 11 points um, for, for making that contact. They have a, a seasonal bonus, which is very nice. So for the, just, this is just for the activators. If you climb a hill in this country, it's typically between November and March time. Um, if you climb a decent size hill, so anything bigger, bigger than one point, so two points up to 10 points, you get an extra three points. So it's a fantastic time of the year to go and do some low point hills and really cash in on the, on the points. And again, it's to try and encourage people up onto the hilltops during the winter period. Um, right, so as I said earlier, QSOs can be really quick um, and they do tend to be quite fast and furious. You get a pile up um, and, and you want to work through them as quickly as you can. However, it is very much up to the activator, how they want to run it. And if they want to have slower QSOs, um, that's absolutely how they're going to do it. All modes are available. Um, to, uh, to classes activating the hill, I need to have made at least four QSOs. I'm not allowed to work through terrestrial repeaters, but I could work through a satellite, but otherwise they're point to point contacts. So why do we do SOTA? Well, of course, it's for the fantastic views, feeling the sun on your face, um, having a nice relaxed, calm afternoon, or as, as of course in the UK, it's typically, you can't see a bloody thing. Um, it's freezing cold, raining, but it's, but it's good fun. But seriously, why, why would we want to do 
SOTA as a portable operator? Well, sometimes you do get absolutely stunning views. This is, I went and worked um, in Snowdonia and uh, I'm at Snowdon, the smirt snowy peak to the right, uh, a little summit called Ur Aran over there in the middle. And I'm actually at the top of a third peak called Ur Hlueth. Um, hope I pronounced that right. So you do sometimes get fantastic views. But the key thing about operating as a SOTA operator is the whole chasing thing. I've got lots of people trying to work me. If I just go out and do a basic portable operation, especially on busy bands, I can struggle. Typically as a portable operator, we're using low power, inefficient aerials. I can struggle to make contacts on a busy band. Whereas a SOTA operator, you are like rare DX. Everyone wants to work you. And the typical experience is you make a couple of calls and suddenly you've got a pile up and hundreds of people are trying to get in touch with you. So it's, it's a fantastic way of generating a lot of traffic and having a really good fun operating period, working lots of different countries um, just, just for the sake of climbing up a hill. So normally during a presentation or so, to, I would talk about the whole gamut of tools that there are for planning, where to go, where you're going to park, the trail you're going to take, how far and how, how far you're going to walk, how long you're going to walk, um, uh, and then um, pl planning the, the, the whole thing from top to bottom, getting maps, um, uploading your logs. There are websites to cover all of these different things for SOTA, and I will give a URL right at the very end, which is like a jump box to all of the various SOTA sites that allow you to do each stage of planning, activating, and, um, and, and then uploading your logs and looking at scores. But the key one I just wanted to cover tonight was SOTA Watch. So this is what's going to give me plenty of um, contacts, plenty of QSOs when I go portable on a SOTA summit. So SOTA Watch is your typical, um, basically spotting tool. And, but there are lots of options for me here to get spotted. So I can spot myself by, if I've got internet access from the top of a summit, by going to the website and, and filling in a form and automatically spotting myself. And I get added to the spotting list. Typically with the hill I'm on, my call sign, what frequencies I'm gonna be using and what modes I'm using. And that flags up to everybody, there's a station here, go and hunt them down. However, as you can imagine, quite a lot of the summits in the UK are a little way away from towns and cities. Coverage isn't always that fantastic with a mobile phone. So there's a, a second option um, where they have an SMS portal. So I can send a text message to a portal to spot myself. So even if I haven't got good data connectivity, if I can get an SMS through, and that's typically about the last thing you can manage with a poor connectivity, I can spot myself. But there's more than that. If you're using APRS, you can also use APRS to spot yourself. I guess you need to have a gateway you can reach, but that, that gives you a third option. And the final option is, you'll, you'll notice this website has two tabs to it, spots. And if I go to the next bit, oops, alerts. Can I, cl can I click on that? No. I thought I would be able to get the alerts. Um, it's got an alert. Oh, yes, I have. There you go. It's got an alerts tab. So if I know I'm going to be operating, what I can do is in advance, log on to here and post an alert to say I'm going to be active. And I put the date, the rough time. Everyone knows I've got to drive there and climb a hill. Like could be plus or minus an hour or two. Um, the modes I'm going to use and my call sign. Now, if I'm using CW, and RBN, the reverse beacon network, picks me up calling CQ SOTA from G0 POT stroke portable. There's a pipe put through to SOTA watch and it will automatically link up that call on RBN with my planned activation here on the alerts page. And again, it'll automatically spot me. And of course, if I just make a single contact with a chaser and most of the chasers are really good and spot you, um, that, that, that's the, the, the last way of getting spotted. And you can really tell when that happens because you're calling for about five, 10 minutes, nothing, you'll work one station and then suddenly the storm des descends on you. So it's absolutely fantastic. So this is what I love about SOTA. It's a great way of making a lot of contacts in a very short space of time and having a really positive and fun um, portable act activity. 
So that is the nuts and bolts of SOTA. And I'm going to put that behind us now. And I thought I would talk a little bit about a proper backpacking station. So a lightweight station for backpacking portable or summits on the air SOTA activities. Now, people often say to me, what's the best radio for, for, for going portable or going SOTA? And my, my response is typically, look, whatever you you've got to do that you're happy to take outdoors it doesn't matter if it's heavy go just go to the local park go somewhere where you can walk a few feet from the car um, and go and have a go at portable and see if you actually enjoy it because there are aspects to it that are challenging you might get cold you might get bitten by mozzies you know it might not be your thing before you spend any money on it but once you've tried it and if you enjoy it and you really want to do that, backpacking that, traveling a bit further, a bit more walking before you set up a station, then this is what I want to cover today, the, the, the criteria for a good backpacking station. And I'm going to look at radios, we'll look at aerials uh, and getting them up in the air. We'll look at batteries and if I've got time, I'll throw in some sundry items as well. But the key thing I'm looking for here with a portable station is I want it to be light, I want it to be rugged, I need it to be flexible, and I want it to be simple, especially when I've got cold fingers and I've got to take the station apart to, to go home. So I need it to be nice and simple to operate and to put up and take down. So let's start with radios. So what are the criteria that you might want to consider if you're looking for a lightweight backpacking radio? So my first thing is weight versus redundancy. Well, weight is obvious. The further you walk, the higher you climb, really the less weight you want to be humping, especially if you're doing a proper long walk where you also have to carry water, food, some spare uh, waterproof clothing in case the uh, in case but when it starts raining, as it always does. Um, so weight is key. But what do I mean by redundancy? Well, I've got some examples here of some. Uh, let me put my laser pointer on so I can point. I've got some examples here of some little single band, single mode radios. They're very light, perfect, fairly simple to operate. The uh, China kits here hasn't got any controls at all. Um, but if I get to the top of my summit, if I've walked two hours to set up and operate and I find this one band is closed or I've brought 40 meters CW and there's a massive CW contest on, I'm going to struggle. So for redundancy, I want options. I want flexibility. So I want multiple frequencies and potentially multiple modes. Now, by choice for HF, I take 20, 30 and 40 meter capability. So whatever radio I take, I want to at least have those three bands. 40 meters gives me pretty much a guaranteed um, QSO here in Europe, daytime or evening time. However, there are a lot of contests at weekends when I'm up on hilltops and it can be incredibly busy. 20 meters opens up the opportunity for some DX. And even with my tiny little a couple of watts of CW US, so which is, is fantastic. But again, contest on 20 meters. Um, if the maximum usable frequency isn't high enough, or if there are um, other issues, corona mass ejection, some are, the sun's not playing, 20 meters might simply not be open. And then what I do is I throw in a walk band. So for me, 30 meters, because I'm typically operating um, CW, but for a voice user, maybe 17 meters gives you options there, 17 meters, because you can't have contest on that band. So you're pretty much guaranteed if the band is open that there'll be a quiet slot that you can set up, call and actually be heard. So that's one of the parts of redundancy. Uh, let's talk about modes, which is kind of the next part of redundancy. Um, Voice is a voice activation when I'm um, portable. You do need to be aware that voice being broader band, 2.7 kilohertz, if you're doing SSB, your power is spread over the entire of that 2.7 kilohertz. So if you're only operating low power, and we're going to talk a bit about power in a second, voice can be a real challenge. Now, I've worked Australia on 10 watts on my KX3 from a SOTA summit. 
here in the UK. But I can tell you now, the other station was doing all the heavy lifting there. So voice is possible, but I'm going to concede that at less than um, kind of 10 watts, it is, is a bit of a struggle. The other thing you need to be aware of is if you're outdoors in the wind, especially on a hilltop, using a microphone, it's going to make it difficult for people to understand you because of the noise on the microphone. And you need to be aware of that because you're not going to know, you're not going to hear that um, when you're transmitting. So you need to find a way to protect the microphone from the wind, either in your jacket or um, build one of those dead cats like they use on um, BBC microphones um, to try and uh, reduce the wind effect on the microphone. Now, I operate CW typically when I'm portable because pound for pound, I'm going to get the best results by using CW. Very narrow bandwidth, all of my energy is going into that. So that's going to allow me to get away with using low power, poor antennas and still make contacts. Now, obviously, you need to be skilled in CW to be able to do that, but uh, it really does make the difference when you're trying to make contacts on a busy band um, with less than optimal um, equipment. There is still data. Data is also a fantastic um, mode for, for low power because, again, the power density, the signal bandwidth is very low. You get your energy um, force into that small bandwidth, fantastic. Um, however, you need to be aware that data modes tend to be very high duty cycle. So PSK Ritty, um, they're transmitting for a lot of the time. Um, and as a result, you can end up draining your batteries very, very quickly. Also, if you're going to do data modes, you typically need then an audio interface and a computing device of some description. And these are all extra things that you have to carry, hope that they still work when you get there, relying on batteries. So data modes can be a little bit challenging. Um, so power, let's talk a little, little bit power. Uh, I've talked about QRP. Um, now, there's nothing stopping you from going backpacking and working 100 watts. But of course, if you're going to do that, you're going to need a radio that can cope, which means bigger radio, heavier radio. Something like an FT-857 is probably a, a, a kind of lightweight entry point for that. But you're also going to need bigger batteries to be able to provide that energy. We're not going to be operating necessarily for a lot of hours, but if you're running 100 watts, you're going to get through that very, very quickly. So, you know, even if you're running more than QRP power, you probably want to limit your kind of voice power to 20, 30 watts um, for portable use, just so you can manage the weight of the radio and the size of the batteries you, you're going to take with you. Waterproofness. Now we're operating out of doors. You'd think waterproofness would be um, the most important thing, but actually finding a waterproof radio in the UK is, is a little bit challenging. Um, obviously, there's quite a few handhelds these days that are waterproof. I've got the Yaesu um, VX6 here, which uh, is waterproof as a, as a handheld. But for HS sets, that they're a little few and far between. Um, I've got a lovely Raycal, uh, is it Raycal? Uh, the PCR320 uh, military backpack, which is waterproof, but it also weighs something like 20 kilograms. It's, it's very heavy. And I see there's a new radio from a company, is it 599 something, um, that is uh, marketed as being proper waterproof now as well but typically radios aren't so you need to think about how you're going to protect your radio from the weather if you're operating and things get a bit inclement and often they do at a hilltop now that might simply be operating with the radio inside the bag or inside something to keep the rain off it but if that's the case you need a fairly simple to operate radio that you're not going to want to be fiddling with the volume and the tuning and everything while you're operating. The last thing I'll just touch on here is the TRF design, this trail friendly radio. So you'll notice that most of the radios here have got controls facing upwards when you lay them on your lap or on the floor. And that just makes 
um, activation while you're portable a lot easier. The 817 with the front controls, even up on its peg legs, it's very difficult to use. Um, so you can't see the screen. It's a bit difficult to see the controls. So these trail friendly designs are, are absolutely fantastic. And you'll even notice the mountain toppers here at the um, bottom, the gray and the blue radio, they don't even have a tuning knob or a volume control. They've got nothing that's going to stick out and get broken off when you're carrying it in your rucksack. So, so, so these really are um, the epiphany of portable um, backpacking lightweight radios. So now I said about the 817 being a bit challenging to use because it is a front panel design, but I do sometimes use mine um, on a SOTA summit and I either leave it tucked inside my rucksack sticking up so I can see the controls sticking out the top of the bag so, so that works or there are options this is an idea from um, Andy G7 UHN he's working on this FT817 buddy but this sort of thing could be built for pretty much any radio with a cat interface and he's basically interfacing this via the cat cable and displaying the frequency and giving some control buttons here to turn on and off and modify important features. Typically tuning around on a radio when you're up on a hilltop is something you're probably not going to do a lot of. You're going to find a, an empty frequency and stick there. So a radio that's easy to tune isn't a massive requirement. As I said, the, um, the little mountain toppers just use button tuning and that's fine because you're going to find a frequency and stay put. Another little sundry item here I've got is this, we refer to this as a dashboard, this orange thing. Um, if you're trying to operate with a small radio and maybe a Morse key and you've got your logging pad and a battery and maybe a watch so that you can keep an eye on the time because of course it's cold and you've got sleeves, long sleeves and you can't see a normal watch on your wrist. Um, then something like a dashboard is quite nice for sticking everything on and resting on your lap. This was a little posh job from Sota Beams. They don't do these anymore, just made out of um, perspex or plastic. Um, a lot of people just use an A4 clip board. Um, you have the clip at the bottom rather than the top, so you can use it to hold your pad. And then you can just uh, use elastic bands or Velcro or something to you know, stick your radio and other little bits and pieces that you want. Um, and it all rests on your lap perfectly. Now, you're going to need to carry that radio in a backpack and you don't want to wreck it on the way to the top of the hill. So you want some sort of protection to pop it in. And I use all manner of things. Now, you might see people using Pelly cases. They're really, really popular. They're fantastic. You can put your radio in there and probably play football with it. But I'm going to say, compared to the size of your radio, they can be quite large. So if you want a Pelly case, you're going to put an 817 in. It's starting to get a bit of a big case, and that's going to take up a lot of space in your backpack. So I try to use something much smaller to provide some mechanical protection. Now, with these tiny radios, I've used things like GoPro. This is a little GoPro camera case which is perfect for putting the mountain toppers, put that in the lid. And you can see here in the bottom, I've got the Morse key, I've got the battery, I've got headphones power lead, uh, the key lead, I've got a headphone extension lead in there. I can fit quite a lot in that package. That's the same, same thing here. The, eight, the mountain topper three band is even tinier. I, I've got the whole station with the exception of a Marston antenna in an old Remington Razor case. And back here, I've got my um, KX3, Ellicraft KX3, which I do have a cover for, but I've slid that in. This is a snug pack. I think it's a water bottle, padded water bottle holder for the army. Um, and that was a perfect fit to just slide that radio in. So I try to find things that give some mechanical protection, but are not massive. And then what I do is I slide the whole thing, whatever radio I've got inside this yellow thing is one of those roll top waterproof bags that you might use when you're canoeing or um, yachting. Um, so they're completely waterproof, put the bag in, roll the top up, seal it. If I get caught in a, a, a flash storm, um, I do have a waterproof cover for my rucksack, but if I don't get it on in time, no worries. Or if one of my water bottles in my backpack bursts, I don't have to worry about it damaging anything in my backpack. So it's just a simple way of keeping a radio reasonably safe and snug while you're doing the actual transportation in your backpack. So that's a little walkthrough 
radios and some good things to look for radios. And of course, I tend to make sure I take at least HF and say a walkie talkie, a two meter 70 cents walkie talkie. It's going to hedge the bets a little bit. If HF is genuinely closed, if I'm up somewhere high, I'm going to make some contacts on the on the walkie talkie. Let's move on to aerials. So um, what are the criteria you might want to consider in a backpacking aerial and getting that up in the up in the air? So I guess we've talked already about low power. One of the reasons for low power or two reasons for low power are radio size and battery size. QRP, low power, means we can take smaller radios and smaller batteries. The other thing is it means we can have quite lightweight aerials. Now, I've, I've seen quite a few people turn up to do a, a SOTA or a portable operation with the uh, a normal home base antenna, which can handle 1500 watts. It's massive, it weighs a ton, um, very hard to get up on uh, off the ground and hold it up with anything that isn't also massive and weighing a ton. So I go really light, this is really fine wire, it doesn't need to be um, particularly heavy duty. I want multi-band. So I said with the radios, I want at least three bands for HF. So we'll talk about HF at the minute. I want three bands for HF. So I need an aerial that's going to give me that capability. So I tend to use either linked or trapped aerials so that I can have a three band aerial that matches my radio. And I either use um, links, which I've got on here with just croc clips at little links so I can break the links. The trouble with that is it means I've got to, if I want to change band, I have to get off my ass and I'm lazy um, to drop the antenna and change the link. So, so I, I grew out of that idea quite quickly. And now I tend to use traps and I use little tiny traps, Pico traps from Sota beams. They're tiny little toroid surface mount capacitor, um, handle up to, I guess, probably 20 watts or so. Uh, and that's perfect for me and for a lightweight portable antenna. Now, I try to use tuned antennas. The reason I want to do that is I don't want to have to take another piece of kit, an ATU, that I'm going to forget or it's going to break. Or you now need a jump lead to connect that AT between the um, ATU and the radio. And that's something else that's going to break or I'm going to forget. So on the idea of simplicity, I try to always use um, tuned antennas for my operation. Now, verticals versus horizontal. There are a wealth of antennas you can use, uh, you know, dipoles, verticals, ground plane, end fed half waves. There's all sorts you can use. There are also quite a lot of commercial antennas out there. I've seen a lot of these very small vertical um, bottom loaded, typically like um, they call it screwdriver, you know, kind of uh, uh, arrangement to, to tune the, uh, the antenna. And then you roll out ground planes to give you some sort of ground plane. I'm not a big fan of them, if I'm honest. Not only are they ridiculously expensive, but I don't find them to be particularly efficient. And they take quite a bit of time to set up, longer than you'd think. Putting out enough counterpoises to make a difference takes time and also then takes quite a bit of area. And you've got to remember that if you're operating on a hilltop, you might be sharing that with a lot of other walkers and other people. So I, I, you have to think about the footprint of your antenna. The other thing is, if you change frequency with those antennas much, um, you, you end up having to retune them every few minutes. And if you're going to do that, you also need some way of measuring the SWR at the radio. So either you need a radio with that built in or an extra meter and another jump lead. Something else to break, something else. So I try and avoid that, that kind of a setup. I've definitely gone my way with um, dipoles and N-fed half wave antennas. Um, what I've just showed here is one of my early um, dipole arrangements. Um, so simple trap dipole for 20, 30 and 40 meters. I've got just enough coax to reach the top of the mast. So I've probably got about 12, maximum 15 meters of coax. You'll notice I'm using very light RG174. It's light to carry and it's light to hold up with a mast. 
RG58 is too heavy. It's too much. You don't need it. Um, I know the losses on RG174 uh, are significantly more than uh, RG58, but they're not that significant, especially HF, especially if you've only got 10 to 15 meters of it. It's just not worth carrying the extra weight. So I, I go with this lower weight um, arrangement. Uh, the other thing is when it comes to setting this up, and I'm going to describe this for using a mast at the moment, um, I can either Velcro this mask to a fence post, which is ideal because that way I can just drop the ends of the antenna down to the fence. Um, that keeps it out of everyone's way. It's the quickest by far setup. I can be set up in just a couple of minutes using that, or I use guying. Now I have seen people that guy the mast and then put up the antenna, which seems just extra effort, extra things to take with you. So I use my antenna as two parts of my guying arrangement and then some extra cord as the third guy. So my antenna is the guy, it's part of my guying system if I need to use that. And that's, it's strong enough, it's happy, um, it doesn't seem to impact the, uh, um, the performance at all. So uh, that just, again, it's making it quick, simple, reducing the amount of things that I need to take with me, which reduces the weight, reduces the complexity. Um, right, let's have a little look about, so we, we uh, in a minute I'll look at um, some two meter 70 SEMS antennas as well. So uh, if I'm specifically using VHF, I'm going to take an external antenna, but even when I take my handheld, You'd be amazed what you can do with just a handheld and a rubber duck on a very tall hill. Um, it's just amazing. However, I still tend to take an external antenna and connect it to my handheld because it gives it even more capability. Um, so we'll have a look at uh, a little VHF, UHF aerial in a minute as well. But for those HF aerials, how do we get them up? We need to get them up in the air. So there's a couple of ideas I've tried here. For better or worse, throw bag and line. So in fact, the throw bag, you don't even need to take a weighted bag. You just need a little bag. And then at the top of a hill, you could put um, a bit of mud, a few stones in, a bit of cord, throw it over the branch of a tree. I love the concept. It's such a, a romantic idea and it does work, but you need a tree. You need that tree to be roughly in the right place. It needs to have a branch that's high enough and it needs that branch to be roughly in the clear so that you can get that weight over the top without tangling your line. And then if once you're tangled in the tree, you're, you're, you're stuffed, you, you, that's the end of your operation. I've not found that to be a particularly effective arrangement. I definitely would take a backup if I'm going to do that. And, and often I'm going to a hilltop or a location where I've never operated before. So I don't know whether I'm gonna have room to uh, a tree to chuck something up in. So I tend not to do that. I've tried kites, which again, lovely idea, nice and light, but you need the right sort of wind, not too windy, not too settled. Um, you, you need good wind and it's, it's a bit variable. It's not reliable. So I tend to use telescopic uh, poles. Um, here I've got a couple of options, 10 meters, seven meters and six meters. I've got top two of fiberglass. This one is carbon fiber. Now, if you are holding up the center of a dipole or an N-fed half wave as an inverted V, then any of these three masks will be perfect. If you want to set up a vertical where you're running the wire up the outside or the inside of the, the telescopic pole, then you need really need to be looking at uh, fiberglass. If you use carbon fiber, you're going to get some interactions there, and I'm not quite sure what the um, effectiveness is going to be. So just be aware of that. Um, the thing, things like the, the carbon fiber six meter, it's really strong. I can use the whole of that. Um, it's absolutely rigid when it's supporting the antenna. It weighs nothing. It's tiny enough to, to fit in my cabin bag when I fly. Um, it's just, you know, uh, about 300, 400 grams. It's fantastic. The 10 meter pole here I've got, this is a SOTA beams um, travel mast. Um, I like it because it's compact. It would pretty much fit in my rucksack, uh, but it's heavy. Um, it's about one and 1.3 kilograms. It weighs a ton and you can't use the top elements. They're too, too lightweight. So I take those out and throw them away, but I probably get about eight and a half, nine meters out of it, which is, which is pretty good. So I said about not taking tuners, but 
sometimes I throw something in just in case as uh, to, to experiment. Um, there are lightweight options out there if you need to take an ATU. Uh, looking at the cheap and the expensive, on the left, I've got the QRP guys um, on antenna. So this is basically a whole antenna option. It's got the uh, transmitting element. It's got a counterpoise. It's got a manual built-in tuner and an SWR indicator. And so these, these are quite cheap, very basic. I'm not overly convinced that it's great, but it, it will work. The other thing I use quite a lot is the Ellicraft T1 tuner, super expensive. It would probably tune a blade of grass. It's ridiculously good. Um, it tunes, shows you the power, shows you the SWR, so that's quite nice. However, it does rely on a battery, which is something that can fail. And also we'll talk about temperature and batteries in a minute. So you can have issues in low temperatures. So that's HF. What about VHF? As I said, I like to use an external antenna, even if I'm just using a handheld. And I, I these days use something that I ripped off of SOTA beams. Again, you'll forgive me for mentioning SOTA beams so often, but they are obviously a, a, an amateur radio supplier of portable lightweight SOTA equipment. So they, they do tend to have some great designs. Um, this was called a two meter multifunctional dipole. It's not available anymore, but they're super easy to build. 20 mil plastic conduit, or I guess this is three quarter, 22 mil um, water pipe. You just get four short lengths. Um, two of them are going to be to hold the antenna up in the air, and the other two are going to form um, the main part of the dipole. Four meters of coax, strip the braid from the inner from the braid for about 50 centimetres and you have a two metre dipole which also works on 70 sems perfectly and you can either set it up as a horizontal as I've done here so when I'm using my FT817 SSB or CW or as I've got here when I'm up in the Mount Snowden area and I've got the, um, the handheld connected to this so I've set it up as a vertical it just gives you that extra little bit of signal out makes it a bit easier for other people to hear you and it's just far more effective than using a rubber duck on a handheld it weighs just about um, 430 grams, about 15 ounces, less than a pound, about 50 centimetres long, so it will fit inside uh, a normal rucksack. So um, yeah, it, it's just very effective for VHF. Let's move on to batteries and keys. How am I doing for time? Yeah, I hopefully still on track. So batteries, what type and size of battery do you need for your backpacking portable um, station? So going back probably yeah, 10, 20 years now, um, the de facto standard was probably the sealed lead acid battery or slab. Now, these things are cheap. They're fantastic because they're cheap. They're pretty mechanically protected. So as so long as you don't short out the contacts, they can swim around in the bottom of your backpack uh, with all sorts of garbage and not get damaged. They only give about 12 volts out and that does drop off as you use it. So they're, they're not consistent over a long period of time and they weigh a ton. Um, and because I like to take redundancy when I'm doing a long walk, I used to have to take two to make sure that I definitely had power. Um, so yeah, the, 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 as soon as another option came along, I quickly moved on and I've moved on to a couple of things. The Li-Fi Po, um, four battery, which is a lithium iron phosphate battery made up of four cells. Now, this has a, a typical output of about 13.2 volts. Um, and if we compared it to a, a slab at the same time, so this is about 4.2 amp hour. A four amp hour slab is about one and a half kilograms, 3.3 pounds. The Li-Fi Po 4.2 um, amp hour battery is less than 500 grams so about a pound so it's about a third of the weight of a slab so you can appreciate it, it's a real advantage if you're walking a long way much much more expensive than a slab battery they need special chargers um, and they do really need monitoring when you're using them so i have a tiny little plug-in monitor that just monitors the individual cell voltages and alarms if any of them get too low but uh, yeah it's a massive saving in weight and actually quite small as a battery 
The other option I use a lot now are the LiPo batteries, these little three cell LiPos. Now, voltage wise, they're a bit awkward. Um, a three cell LiPo is supposed to be 11.1 volts and a four cell is about 14.8 volts, I think. When they're fully charged, the three cell is actually about 12 and a half volts. Um, so the four cell is probably over 15 volts. So I tend to use the three cell, but I guess you could use a four cell and maybe a diode to drop some voltage or a DC to DC converter. But again, these are super light. You come in a huge range of sizes. The, the Life IPO, unfortunately, is very hard to get hold of and is typically about the four amp hour mark. They don't seem to do a huge range in these, whereas the LiPos, you can get them in all sorts of sizes. So you can think about your own need and find something that matches. So when I'm operating and using my little mountain topper here, which probably puts out about three or four watts of power, I can take this tiny little 460 milliamp um, LiPo battery, and that will actually last me all weekend, uh, certainly last me for a couple of hours of um, sending. Uh, but yeah, a small battery like that will last me on the mountain topper for, for a whole weekend. In comparison, the four amp power life I po, I know I've worked um, backpacking contests, shouting for four hours solid using two and a half watts from an FT817, and that's lasted the competition. Wouldn't have done much more. So if you were going to use five watts and wanted to do four hours of constant sending, you'd want a couple. But uh, yeah, for, for normal use, not contest, for normal um, portable activity, one of those will power an FT817 or a KX3 at 10 to 15 watts um, for several hours without any problems at all. There's still, of course, the old fashioned nickel cadmium or nickel metal hydride options, making up little packs with the AA size cells. And, and the, the joy of those are if you're away camping for an extended time and maybe struggle to charge your batteries, then you can always just go to the local shop and pick up some alkaline um, double A's to replace them uh, to keep you going. So that, that, that's they're old, old chemistries now. They're not the best for long periods of time, um, long operating uh, periods, but they are quite flexible. Size wise, well, we talked about size a little bit already. Um, it, it, it does depend on the mode you're going to use. It does depend on the type of activity you're going to do and how much you're going to be shouting. But one of these four amp hour um, life I pose are fantastic for voice, for, for getting, you know, 10, 10 watts of voice for a few hours, no problems at all. And if you're doing CW with something um, that smaller like the mountain toppers or a, uh, a, a UKIT's HB1B or, or a smaller radio like that, then these LiPos can be fantastic. Now I touched on temperature earlier. Batteries are very susceptible to drops in temperature. And when you get up on a hilltop in you know, a British winter, it can be cold enough to affect them. So when I was operating from the top of Snowdon, I think the wind chill um, last March when I was up there in the snow was about minus 20. It was an 80 kilometer an hour wind. So it was about minus 20. At one point, I took my iPhone out of my pocket. The battery was at 90%. And within two minutes, it dropped to 20%. So it has a massive effect on batteries. Now, obviously, when I put that back in my pocket and warmed it up, we were good. Power went back up again. And I do the same with my little batteries. If I'm operating somewhere extremely cold, and I do sometimes, especially in the snow, what I'll do is take a slightly longer power lead so I can actually slip the, the battery under my jumper or inside my coat and just keep it warm. But it's just something to be aware of, especially if you're using you know, a device to log, to GPS, you know, to find where you're going, to spot yourself. If you're doing all these things on a mobile phone, be aware that temperature can have a, a, a big effect. So uh, let me move on to keys. How am I doing? I'm doing, doing okay for time. I'll wrap this up fairly shortly. So, um, as I said, I'm a CW operator. I like to take uh, my key with me. I do find it one of the most effective modes for portable and SOTA operation. But you can obviously imagine taking your lovely Begali key up to the top of the hill, having it bounce around in the backpack, getting out in the rain, the mud, sand, whatever. It's not going to love you for it. So, you really want something a little bit more specialized for hilltop operating. Now I do use straight keys occasionally, 
Um, and here I've got a lovely bathtub key. These are still quite cheap on, on eBay, but they do make a fantastic portable key if you want a straight key. Because they're sealed, they were designed not to let the spark of the key um, ignite the fumes in, in the, I think, the old bomber aircraft. And um, so they're completely sealed. So, so they, they, it keeps out the moisture, keeps out the grit. However, with a straight key, you really want a firm surface to work on. Now, you can strap these things to your leg um, and it is doable, but I do find them a little bit erratic and it can be a bit challenging depending on your operating location. I prefer to use a paddle if I can because I can hold it in one hand and send with the other. I used to love the palm keys. Um, this is the, from the German palm um, key company, but they went out of business uh, or they retired the business a few years ago. However, I noticed there's a couple of new companies who have started making, not quite as small as this, but a very similar design. And the design is that you can retract the paddle inside the, the metal case, protecting the paddle while it's in your backpack. So that's a really nice feature. And as I said, there's a couple of new um, manufacturers on the market doing something very similar. My key of choice these days tends to be the teeny key. So this is a little key made from the um, designer made by guys at North Ottawa Amateur Radio Club. And it basically uses a couple of beryllium copper strips to touch a, a screw head. It's as simple as that. It's very easy to bend the contacts around if I need to make small adjustments when I'm on a hilltop. However, if it does get squashed or crushed, I mean, these are sprung. They, I, I've been carrying this around now for a few years and I haven't yet damaged it to the point where I need to take any action. However, if you were to bend one of these quite radically, I think you can just put a lighter underneath them, heat them up and they pop back into shape again. So they have kind of a shape memory to them. But I find this to be very resilient to bashing around in the bottom of my bag. Um, and the final one I've got here, just as a, an example, this is a, a touch key by a, a Spanish station called EA, EA7 HAG. Touch keys are fine, but just be warned if you're out of doors in humid conditions or where temperatures are changing a lot, um, they can become a bit erratic. So I wouldn't take a touch key as my only option. I do have some built into some of my radios, um, but I, I always make sure I have a mechanical key with me as well, just in case. And the other thing, just talking about heat, um, is I tend to make the gap setting on my keys slightly bigger when I'm portable. Either my hands are freezing and shaking, and it's very easy to um, uh, sound a dit or a da when you don't mean to, so having a bit of space gives you a bit of leeway. But also if you've then got uh, extreme changes in temperature, getting very hot, if things expand a little bit, you don't suddenly find your key shorting out. So having bigger key gaps are, are good. But yeah, I'm definitely a fan of the paddles, but you do want something that's basically bomb proof. You don't want something that's going to be affected um, and go out of sync when it's being bashed around in your, in your backpack. Um, leave that for the shack, take something smaller, cheaper if you can, lighter, um, and that's easy to uh, modify in the field if you need to make any adjustments. So guys, that was a whistle stop tour through summits on the air, lightweight backpacking, and the concepts and ideas for building a station. And I just thought I'd end up with a quick photo from one of my outings where I've unpacked my rucksack with my station before setting up. This is what I'm going to use. Um, my 10 metre mast, which is a favourite, um, with the long Velcro straps to strap to um, a, 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 a fence frame if I can. This is an end-fed half wave. I prefer this over the dipole because where's the dipole? I need about 10 to 50 metres of coax. For my end-fed, I've literally got about 30 centimetres, about a foot of coax there. So it weighs nothing. And this has got the little Pico traps from Soda Beams in it. It's a three-band end-fed half wave. A couple of aluminium stakes just in case I need them. I paper log rather than logging on a phone or an iPad or something like that because come rain, shine, whatever, I can still write on a piece of paper with a pencil. Um, sometimes the touch screen on devices stops working in uh, humid conditions and temperature changes. 
I love the little mountain top of 3B because um, it's super small, super lightweight. This is literally the size of a pack of cards. They have just launched a brand new, I think it's going to be the 4B. So they're doing a four band. This is from um, LNR Precision in the US. Um, they, they haven't made any of the 3Bs for a long time, so they've just launched a new four band version. I've got the tiny little 460 milliamp hour LiPo battery, headphones, uh, a little Pico paddle on the side of that, and um, just a foam mat to keep my, my bottom warm and dry uh, when I'm sitting on the ground. And of course, although I'm doing most of my, uh, my um, tracking to find my route and find where I am using GPS on my phone, I always take a manual way of doing it. Um, including a paper map, including where I'm going to park, the route I'm going to take, and I give a copy of that to my partner before I go, so that just in case I don't come back, they know where I was going to park and the route I was going to take so the emergency services can find me. So that is pretty much my typical backpacking station. And you can see just how tiny that is. Master side, it's a tiny little station. Guys, that was a super whistle stop tour through um, portable, lightweight backpacking and SOTA radio. I hope that was informational, uh, interesting and useful. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions uh, following that. Um, if just a couple of uh, contact info bits at the end. Uh, you remember at the beginning I said about SOTA, there was a single website you could go to to, to get to all of the other um, planning and logging and mapping and all the rest of it. Um, that website is SOTA.org.uk. If you go there, it links to all the other resources. That's fantastic. Uh, if you want to find me at all online, I'm on Twitter as at Dr. Orthogonal. Um, I have a website at peanutpower.co.uk where I have information about my NFED half wave antenna, how to build one. So if you want to do a super lightweight half wave NFED antenna, the instructions are, are on there. You can email me if you have any questions offline after this. And I also have a YouTube channel. Um, I haven't had a, very much time in the last year with COVID and everything, but I tend to do a lot of equipment reviews and um, descriptions. So a lot of um, ham radio content looking at uh, the stuff I use. So a lot of lightweight radios, um, a lot of CW stuff on there. Guys, I hope that was um, OK for you. And uh, I'll. Uh, just stop sharing now and open the floor to any discussions or questions.